Okay, well, maybe we can start uh, because it's recorded. Maybe you can start without Abhinav. I mean, Abhinav can probably join a little bit later, but um, it's a pleasure to have uh, Devena Chaplot uh, defending his PhD thesis. Uh, Devena, maybe you can share your screen. And for the protocol, um, I think that uh, Devena is going to give like a 40 minute talk. Uh, if you have any clarifying questions, you can ask, but if it's a long question, let's wait until he's done. Um, and then um, uh, we're going to have questions from the thesis committee, uh, starting, uh, I guess, from Jitendra, the furthest away. Um, and then uh, after that, we're going to go to the audience, if there are questions from the audience, and, and, and that's about it. As Devendra gives a talk, if you could mute yourself, uh, that would be, that would be uh, great. Okay, and today's uh, demand is going to be talking about building intelligent autonomous navigation agents. Just one, um, just one. Hi, Abhinav here. Just one second. Oh, hey, Abhinav. Okay, oh, you're here. Excellent. Uh, one thing I wanted to say was um, I don't have internet at my home. I'm using my phone right now. Um, so that's okay. Some, yeah, so that's why I, I mean, so in case I'm not here, I'm still here. I mean, or yeah. I'll okay. suggest <laughs> no problem, Abhinav. Thanks for joining. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, thanks, uh, everyone, for joining in. So today, um, I'm going to be talking about our thesis work on building intelligent autonomous navigation agents. Um, so as Russ said, uh, feel free to uh, stop me for any clarifying questions. Uh, so let's get started. Advances in machine learning um, in the last decade have led to digital intelligence, we are now able to collect massive static data sets from the internet and train machine learning models capable of image classification, object detection, speech recognition, machine translation, and so on. So in the recent few years, there has been a lot of interest in building autonomous agents capable of physical intelligence, also known as embodied AI. So a physically intelligent agent interacts with an environment by receiving observations and taking physical actions. And what makes this more exciting and at the same time more challenging than digital intelligence is that the agent has control over its future observations. And one of the core problems involved in building intelligent physical agents is navigation. The problem is very easy to define. The objective is to take actions to reach a specified goal location in the environment. The problem of navigation has a very rich history. Uh, and it has been extensively studied in classical robotics for over three decades. I'm just showing one interesting example here. This robot is called Rhino. It was designed by researchers at CMU and University of Bonn back in 1998. And um, it's claimed to be the first robot that provided museum tours. The robot used a typical modular navigational pipeline, which requires a map to be pre-computed or pre-specified. Then the map is used to localize the robot using specialized laser or sonar sensors. And based on the location of the robot, a path is planned to the goal location using analytical path planning algorithms. In the recent few years, there has been a lot of work on training navigational policies using end-to-end -end reinforcement learning. Here, the agent is given a positive or negative reward for reaching the correct or wrong locations. And it essentially learns by trial and error. So we use this rewards to learn the parameters of a neural network, which predict actions directly from input observations. And this framework of end-to-end -end reinforcement learning uh, is very powerful. It can be used to train different types of navigation policies. So in the past, we have used this framework to uh, train navigational policies to avoid obstacles, collect objects, and even play first-person shooter games just by changing the reward function. Now, obviously, we don't want to train a different policy for each goal location, which brings us to goal condition data, where we basically give the goal location as input to the neural network in addition to the observations. Goals can be provided in different formats, such as point coordinates, images, object categories, or even language instructions. So another example of end-to-end uh, -end reinforcement learning for uh, language instructions. In our previous work, we have used this framework to train navigational policies for simple uh, language instructions in maze-like environments. And we show that we can train agents to follow language instructions about objects with different shapes, sizes, and color, and also answer questions about them. And the key result here is that the agent can learn semantic perception and reasoning just from rewards and generalize to new instructions and questions and even transfer the knowledge of concepts between both the tasks. 
the framework of end-to-end -end RL is very powerful, but it has some key shortcomings. So in many of these maze-like environments where RL policies are typically trained, you might have seen a lot of objects or fruits spread randomly across the environment. So remember that the RL agents are learning by trial and error. So these objects not only provide dense rewards to the agent, but also provide a dense visual feedback. Whenever I see a fruit in front of me, I can take the forward action, I get a positive reward. But in most realistic environments, uh, there is only one or a few correct locations and they are often very far. This makes uh, exploration, exploration very difficult for an end-to-end -end RL policy and leads to very high sample complexity. Similarly, in the language goal environment, we placed a few objects in a small room, but if we hide these objects in corners, it becomes difficult for the agent to explore the environment exhaustively. And this is because it requires both a long-term memory and long-term planning, which is again, very difficult to learn just by trial and error. So let's try to compare these two classes of methods. So one obvious difference is classical navigation methods are modular while recent learning based methods are end to end. The classical methods use explicit maps and analytical planning, whereas memory and planning are implicitly encoded in the parameters of a neural network in a learning based model. And finally, the classical methods use a rule based policy to go to the goal location, uh, but in learning based methods, we can learn a policy to go to different types of goals. And these properties lead to different strengths and weaknesses for both classes of methods. So use of explicit maps allow classical methods to be very effective at spatial or geometric understanding of the scene. And explicit maps are also an effective form of long-term memory and can be used for planning to distant goals very easily. But in turn, they lack semantic understanding and they cannot tackle semantic navigation tasks as they're only building a geometric map and then they use a rule-based policy. On the other hand, learning-based methods can be effective at short-term semantic understanding and are uh, more generalizable as they can learn and improve with experience and be applied to unseen environments and goals. But they struggle at long-term navigation as implicitly learning about mapping and planning just from rewards is difficult and exploration in large environments is very expensive. So we can roughly divide the navigation problem space into four quadrants based on spatial and semantic understanding and short-term and long-term navigation. As we have seen in some examples, end-to-end -end learning uh, can be very good at short-term spatial as well as semantic understanding. And on the other hand, classical methods are good at spatial understanding in the short-term and to some extent even in the long-term. So in this thesis, uh, our aim is to tackle this long-term semantic navigation uh, task space, which are difficult for both these types of methods. In the past few years, we have worked towards this goal. And I mentioned some of our previous work on short-term spatial and semantic understanding using end-to-end -end learning in game-like environments. Our recent work tackles long-term navigation tasks in visually and physically realistic environments. And in this talk, I'm gonna describe three of these works, which are all based on lessons we have learned uh, from our prior research towards this goal. And the central problem which all of these works are trying to tackle is how do we build long-term navigation systems capable of both spatial and semantic understanding. And to tackle this problem, we essentially formulate a new class of methods based on modular learning, which leverage the strengths of both classical and end-to-end -end learning based methods. All the methods are gonna, I'm gonna to describe today uh, belong to this class of modular learning based methods, which have two key properties. First. We use them, we, we modularize the navigation system, but use learning to train each module so that they can learn about semantics, improve with data and generalize to unseen environments. And second, we use explicit structured map representation, uh, just like in classical methods. So we'll see how this modularization and use of explicit maps uh, help in addressing the drawbacks of end-to-end -end learning and lead to uh, effective long-term memory and planning with much lower sample complexity. So I talked about all these different types of navigation tasks uh, based on different goal specification, but to solve all of these tasks in large unseen environments, the agent needs to explore the environment efficiently to find the goal location. And exploration is a key challenge in building long-term navigation agents. So when an autonomous agent is dropped in an unseen environment, has uh, no information about this environment, it has to explore the environment as, 
as fast as possible. So we designed a modular learning model called Active Neural Slam to tackle this problem of exploration. It consists of three modules. The first module is called Neural Slam, and it predicts a top-down 2D map and the agent pose from incoming RGB observations and sensor pose readings. The map here consists of obstacle predictions as shown in dark green and uh, explored area predictions shown in light blue. The second module called the global policy takes this predicted map and poses input and outputs a point on the spatial map as the long-term goal. Given the long-term goal, we plan a path to the goal from the agent's current pose estimate using an analytical planner such as Dijkstra or ASTAR. And then we sample a short-term goal on this path, which is then fed to the third module called the local policy. And the local policy basically takes low-level navigational actions based on first-person RGB observations to reach this short-term goal. So let's try to understand uh, each of these modules. Firstly, the neural SLAM module. Um, this is a neural network which uses convolution deconvolution uh, operations to encode the visual observations uh, and decode it into a top-down 2D map. This is trained with supervised learning uh, for both map and pose, and it learns structured uh, map and pose representations. And these structured representations not only allow the global policy to learn uh, in a top-down domain invariant space, but also allows us to leverage analytical path planning. So let's see um, how the architecture of this neural SLAM module. It takes consecutive camera images and sensor pose readings as input. We pass each, each camera image through a mapper unit, which is a convolutional neural network, to predict an egocentric projection or a top-down map of the environment. So in this egocentric projection, the agent is at the bottom center and it's looking upwards. Uh, the map prediction consists of two channels, one for obstacles and the other one for explored area. Then we use the sensor pose readings to get an initial estimate of the relative pose change. So this relative pose change might be noisy because our uh, sensors can be noisy. So we use this relative pose change to transform the egocentric pr prediction of the last observation in current observations point of view. And then we pass these uh, two estimates through a pose estimator unit, which basically uh, predicts the change in pose to align these two observations as uh, well as possible. We then use the final pose estimate to do an, another spatial transformation to convert the egocentric map projection of the current observation into ge the geocentric map. And then the geocentric map is aggregated over time uh, by just using channel-wise pooling with the previous map estimate. And this um, complete unit is called the neural slam module. As I mentioned, this is trained with supervised learning for both map and pose. The global policy is a convolution neural network. Again, uh, this one is trained with uh, reinforcement learning uh, with increase in explored area as the reward. Uh, so the key thing here is that it operates at a coarse time scale, meaning that it samples a long-term goal every 25 local steps. And this essentially allows us to reduce the time horizon for adult training and learn exploration in a sample efficient way. And finally, the local policy is also a convolution neural network, but this uh, is trained using imitation learning. It is used to take navigational actions at every step. So since it only learns to go to short-term goals, it can be trained in comparatively uh, fewer samples in, a, in a, a sample efficient way. So in our exploration task setup, we use uh, Gibson and Matterport 3D data sets and the Habitat Simulator. These data sets are based on real-world reconstructions. Uh, we also use um, actuation and motion sensor noise models based on real-world data. And the objective is to ma maximize the explored area. And we are going to use two metrics, absolute coverage in meter square and percentage of the environment explorer percentage coverage. And the agent has a fixed time budget of 1000 steps to explore as much area as possible. And this is a demo video of the Acta Mural Slam model. Uh, this is trained on the Gibson data set in Habitat Simulator. Uh, the first per person RGB observations are shown on the left and the model predictions are shown on the right. 
the map predictions are shown in green and the agent post predictions are in, in red. And the long-term goal chosen by the global policy is shown by the blue circle. So the video shows that the map and pose uh, predictions are pretty accurate and the agent learns to explore uh, efficiently in an unseen environment. So some uh, results, we are comparing Active Neural SLAM with four baselines, which are different variants of end-to-end -end RL. We can see that Active Neural SLAM achieves uh, considerably higher performance as compared to all the baselines. And we can also transfer the model trained on the Gibson dataset uh, to the Matterport 3D dataset, and the performance benefits are maintained. Here we are trying to analyze the importance of different modules in uh, Active Neural SLAM by removing different modules and replacing them with classical counterparts. So in the first ablation, we are removing the local policy and we replace it by a deterministic planner. In the second one, we are replacing the global policy with a classical frontier-based exploration heuristic, which just goes to the nearest unexplored area. And in the third one, we just remove the pose estimation module and uh, just use the noisy pose from the sensor directly. So there are some um, interesting results here. The first is that the local policy does not improve much over the deterministic policy. And this is probably because we do not have any dynamic obstacles. So just using a deterministic uh, planner works almost as well. And the second key result is that the global policy and pose estimation model mostly help in large scenes. This makes sense as in smaller scene, you can explore a large portion of the environment by just, by just turning around and uh, the pose error does not accumulate too much. So it turns out that active neural SLAM model can uh, train for expression can be directly transferred to the point goal task without any fine tuning. We can just replace the global policy uh, with a deterministic policy, which always selects the point goal as the long-term goal. And this version of the active neural SLAM model actually uh, won the CVPR 2019.9 habitat challenge. So exploration and point goal uh, navigation mostly requires spatial or geometric understanding of the scene. I'm going to talk about how we can tackle uh, semantic navigation tasks using uh, explicit semantic map representations in the next part. But uh, before I move on, I'll pause for a moment to see if there are any questions up till this point. So up till this point, um, um, I talked, I briefly reviewed the active neural SLAM model, which was uh, part of my thesis proposal talk. And I'm gonna um, present uh, our extensions to that model to kind of tackle long-term semantic navigation tasks. So um, the key challenge in um, semantic navigation tasks is uh, learning semantic priors or common sense. So consider this example where an agent is dropped in an unseen environment and it's asked to go to an oven or uh, shown a target image of an oven. So we as humans, we have the common sense that ovens are typically found in kitchen. So most of us would choose path number two here as, as it is leading to the kitchen. And so the key challenge here is how do we build navigation models to learn such semantic priors or common sense. And uh, we design a modular learning model to tackle uh, the object goal navigation task. The setup is very similar. The agent is again dropped in an unseen environment. And this time it's asked to navigate to a goal, let's say uh, a dining table. The inputs of, to the model are again, the first person camera image and a pose estimate from an onboard sensor. And the objective is to take actions to reach this goal object and uh, stop at the goal location. The environment is completely unseen. The agent receives no experience in this environment and it's not provided with a map or any other information about the environment. So uh, we designed a model called Semantic Exploration or SEMEX. It uh, again consists of three modules. The first uh, is a semantic mapping module, which predicts a semantic map of the environment given a series of observations and pose estimates. The semantic map representations consist of separate channels for obstacles, explored area, and each of the C possible semantic categories. Once we have the semantic map, we pass it through a goal-oriented semantic policy to decide a long-term goal. 
And this policy is responsible for learning semantic priors. Uh, it, it, is, uh, it learns to select long-term goals, which are more likely to reach the goal object as fast as possible. And once this long-term goal is selected, uh, this time we are using a deterministic local policy because we saw uh, a learned local policy does not help too much. And this uh, deterministic local policy just uses analytical path planning to take low-level navigation actions to reach this long-term goal. So in order to incorporate the semantics, we replace the obstacle map in active neural slam with a semantic map. And in the semantic map, we just add separate channels for each semantic category uh, we are interested in to this map. In order to build this semantic map, we first pass the RGB observations uh, through an object detection and segmentation model, such as a mask ICNN. And we use the depth observations to create a point cloud with XYZ coordinates of all the pixels in this frame. We then associate each pixel in this point cloud with the corresponding semantic category prediction from the object segmentation output. And the point cloud is then projected into a voxel representation using a differentiable projection operation. And each cell in this voxel representation contains C plus one values, which indicates whether the cell is occupied or not, and whether it belongs to one of the C possible categories or not. And summing over the height dimension of this voxel representation over each label gives us different channels of the projected semantic map. Now, small errors in first person semantic proje predictions can lead to very large errors in projected map space. So if the boundary of the, uh, the prediction is slightly larger than the actual object, the predictions will get projected to the wall behind the object. And to get rid of these errors, the projected semantic map is then passed through a denoising neural network to get the final semantic map prediction. The egocentric map is aggregated over time using spatial transformations and channel-wise pooling, uh, just like the active neural slam model. And once we have the semantic map, we pass it through a goal-oriented semantic policy uh, to decide the long-term goal. This goal-oriented semantic policy is again a convolutional neural network, but this time it's trained um, to, to minimize the time required to reach the given object goal instead of maximizing coverage. So the long-term policy in active neural slam was goal agnostic. It was just trying to maximize coverage, but here uh, the long-term policy is goal-oriented it is learning a policy to reach uh, the given goal object as fast as possible. Once a long-term goal is selected, um, as I mentioned, we take low-level navigational actions using a deterministic local policy uh, to reach this long-term goal. So in our object goal navigation task setup, um, we are again using Gibson and Matterport 3 datasets. The objective is to reach the goal as fast as possible, and we are using uh, two different metrics this time, the success rate uh, and SPL, which is success rated by path length, uh, which, act, which basically measures the efficiency of the path taken to the goal location in addition uh, to the success criteria. And this time the agent has a maximum uh, episode length of 500 steps. Uh, if it doesn't find the goal location within this time budget, uh, it is considered as a failure. So here is a demo video of the semantic exploration model. Um, again, the observations are on left, the predicted semantic map on the right. Uh, different colors are showing different semantic categories. So we can see that the, uh, the agent is able to predict the semantic map pretty accurately and uh, it's selecting long-term goal to reach the goal object efficiently. Um, again, we compare our models uh, with different baselines. So this time we are comparing with two uh, baselines based on end-to-end -end reinforcement learning and two based on modular navigation. First one using uh, classical mapping and frontier-based exploration and then using uh, the active neural slam model. So uh, we see that the modular learning models outperform both end-to-end -end learning and classical uh, methods. And the performance benefit over active neural slam uh, basically indicates that the model is learning some sort of semantic bias. So let me 
uh, and the performance benefits also uh, translate to the Matterport 3D data set again. So let me uh, show an example of uh, learning semantic priors. So we are initializing active neural slam model and um, semantic exploration model uh, at the same state. And we are asking them to go uh, find a toilet. And uh, on the left, the active neural slam model, it's goal agnostic. It's trying to just maximize the explored area. But on the right, uh, because the semantic exploration policy is goal oriented, it finds the uh, goal object efficiently. And um, our submission to object nav habitat challenge in CVPR 2020 uh, was based on the SEMEX model and uh, it, it uh, led to the winning entry. Uh, similarly, we also designed a modular learning model for image goal navigation. Uh, the task again is very similar. The objective is to take uh, actions to navigate to the goal image and take the st stop action at the goal location. So we designed a modular learning model uh, called Neural Topological SLAM to tackle this task. So instead of metric maps in active neural SLAM and semantic exploration models, this model builds a topological map uh, where nodes are denoting areas in the environment and edges are denoting spatial relationship between them. So we discussed this model during the thesis proposal, so I'll not go into the details here, but the key takeaway is that we observe very similar trends among end-to-end -end learning models, uh, classical methods, and modular learning-based methods. So now let's try to compare um, modular learning methods with both these other classes of methods and try to understand why we are getting uh, such performance benefits. Firstly, as compared to the end-to-end -to -end learning models, Active Nega Slam achieves uh, 95% coverage as compared to 79% for the best end-to-end uh, -end RL baseline. And similarly, semantic exploration and neural topological SLAM models achieve a success rate of 54 and 63% as compared to 16 and 33% for the best end-to-end -end learning baseline. And uh, we also saw that across all these tasks, the performance of all modular learning models at 500,000 frames uh, was actually higher than the performance of the best end-to-end -end learning baseline at uh, 75 million frames. And this indicates that uh, modular learning leads to uh, more than 150 times better sample efficiency. So why are we uh, seeing this benefit? So unlike end-to-end -end RL, uh, we are using structured maps which have spatial priors encoded in them. So it's much easier for the global policy or the long-term policy to learn uh, to explore from these spatial maps as uh, they can see the, ex the current explored area explicitly in these uh, maps. And secondly, the global and local policy are hierarchical in nature. As I mentioned, the global policy picks a long-term goal every 25 steps. And the time horizon for RL exploration is reduced significantly because of that. And this uh, essentially leads to much more efficient exploration. And finally, the end-to-end -end RL policies need to learn to plan from scratch just using rewards. And this turns out to be a very challenging problem. But in, in the modular learning models, planning is essentially coming for free because we are using explicit maps. And we can just use analytical path planning algorithms on, this, on these maps uh, to plan a path to the long-term goal. Classical methods are uh, not directly applic applicable in many of our experiments as they lack semantic understanding capabilities. But in our ablations, when we replace the global or long-term policy uh, by the frontier-based exploration heuristic, we saw significant drops uh, in performance consistently across all these different tasks. And this is because um, in, in the modular learning model, the global policy can learn what part of the map is more likely to lead to more explored area or, or uh, to the goal location. Uh, whereas in the frontier-based exploration heuristic, it's just going to the nearest unexplored area. It's goal agnostic. And qualitatively, we saw that in exploration, um, the, these benefits are coming from situation where a small area behind some furniture is unexplored, uh, where this classical heuristic would actually go behind the furniture to explore where there's nothing behind. But in, in a learning-based policy, 
it can learn that it's just a corner and use the time widget to explore larger areas. So uh, among the semantic navigation tasks, both object goal and image goal navigation, uh, we saw that our models achieve a success rate of roughly 55 to 65%. And the failure modes consist of uh, two types of failures. One is inefficient exploration where the goal location is not explored uh, within the time budget. And the second is ineffective perception where uh, the agent does not stop at the current code location. It either uh, finds the object but does not recognize it or it stops at the wrong object. So let me uh, give some examples of this ineffective perception failure case. So in the left, I'm show showing uh, a false positive case. The goal here is to find a chair um, and the agent uh, confuses the staircase to be a chair. And on the right, there is a false negative case where the agent is looking for a toilet, but it passes through the bathroom and doesn't recognize the toilet. And the reason uh, these errors occur is that is because we are using models trained on static internet data uh, and applying it, them uh, in the active embodied setting. And um, there, there are various cases of failures. Uh, firstly, the viewpoints in the static internet data sets are very different. Uh, these are images taken by humans with a uh, uh, good field of view and uh, the objects in the center. But in the active embodied set setting, this is not the case. But more importantly, um, in the active embodied setting, the agent has control over its future, future observation. So if it is unsure uh, about a certain object, it can look at it from different angles uh, to make sure uh, that the semantic perception is accurate. But this kind of uh, ability is non-existent in uh, static internet perception models. So in uh, cognitive science, perception action uh, is considered as a loop and the visual navigation we have seen so far is just one part of the loop where we are using perception to take better action. But uh, inversely, we can also use action to improve our perception model. And this is the problem of active visual learning, um, which can be utilized to improve our perception. So in the next part, I'll briefly describe uh, how we can use the same modular framework, uh, learn, modular learning framework to learn exploration policies to improve our perception models. Uh, I'll stop for a moment, see if there are any questions up to this point. All right, let's move on. So uh, as I described, we would like to tackle this active visual learning problem where given a pretend object detection or segmentation model, how do we um, learn a policy to gather these observations to improve this model? And um, the, the key properties you want in this exploration policy that is that it should generate observations of objects and not walls or ceilings. It should observe as many unique objects as possible. And uh, it should observe images with incorrect object detection so that if we learn using those observations, we can improve our uh, perception model. And in order to learn this exploration policy in a self-supervised manner, we define this notion of semantic curiosity uh, as the temporal inconsistency in object detections in a trajectory. So if the same object is labeled differently from different viewpoints in a trajectory, then we give the agent a higher reward. But instead, uh, but instead if the detections are consistent across different viewpoints, then we give the agent a low, lower reward. And we compute the semantic curiosity reward by building a semantic map, very similar to the semantic mapping we used for object goal navigation. The only difference being with, that we are not using uh, two channels for explored area and obstacle maps anymore, and only the C semantic category channels. And then we can compute the semantic curiosity reward uh, by just summing over the height and uh, the length and the breadth of this complete semantic uh, map. So summing over the height 
encourages temporal in inconsistencies as the same object with multiple different uh, object category predictions will lead to a higher reward. And summing across the length and breadth of the map encourage observing uh, as many unique objects as possible. We train and evaluate this learned exploration policy in three steps. Uh, first, uh, we use the uh, we use the tra a trained exploration policy. Use, uh, we, we train the exploration policy using a semantic curiosity reward. Second, we use the trained exploration policy uh, to generate observations and use them to fine tune our perception model. And third, we test the fine tune perception model on held out, held out data. And the set of environments used for all these three steps are disjoint, meaning that both the exploration policy and the fine tuned perception model are tested on uh, novel scenes. So first let's see uh, the trained exploration policy. This is a video showing um, the trajectories of policy trained using semantic curiosity reward. Um, the, the policy learns to observe as many unique objects as possible and tries to maximize uh, the, the number of viewpoints an object is viewed from to maximize the semantic curiosity reward. And we can see many examples of temporal inconsistencies in these observations gathered uh, using the semantic curiosity policy. So in this example, a uh, chair gets mislabeled as a couch from certain viewpoints. And in this one, the dining table and chair are mislabeled as uh, sink and toilet. And in this another example, uh, the bed is mislabeled as couch. And these errors during exploration indicates that the object detection system gets better data to learn from uh, using the semantic curiosity policy. And once we have this um, policy, we use it to generate training data for fine tuning our perception model. In this step, we assume access to an oracle for uh, labels uh, in this training trajectory. So here I'm showing the performance of a pre-trained uh, faster than CNN model on trajectories generated uh, by different exploration policies. So we want the exploration policy to sample hard data uh, where the pre-trained uh, object detector fails because uh, data where the pre-trained model already works well would not be useful for uh, fine tuning. So lower performance here is better. And the results indicate that the uh, performance using semantic curiosity policy is uh, lower. And finally, we test this uh, fine-tuned semantic module on held out data. And then uh, the results indicate that the model strain using the semantic curiosity policy exploration data lead to much better object detection performance as compared to uh, baselines based on coverage-based exploration and prediction error curiosity. So uh, as compared to just the pre-trained model, uh, which is trained on internet data, there's a big improvement in the performance of semantic curiosity policy. And this basically highlights the importance of active visual learning. By learning how to move in the environment, we can significantly improve the perception in embodied agents. Sorry, can I say clarification? Mm -hmm. um, how is that slide different from the previous one? Uh, so in, in uh, you mean this slide? Yeah. So here we are uh, looking at the quality of object detections on the training trajectories. So the, the, here we are looking at different exploration policies and using the, uh, use the observations gathered by them and uh, tested using just a pre-trained faster RCNN model. So here lower performance is better because this is basically saying that uh, the exploration risk policy is sampling harder data. I see the it's same able... model is being tested in all these cases. Yes, exactly. Um, and then uh, in the next step, we are uh, testing the fine tune model, the model which is fine tuned using the data collected by these policies and testing them on held out data. And now we are seeing improvement in performance because harder data leads to better learning. Okay, to summarize, uh, we formulated a new class of methods based on modular learning, which leverage the strengths of both classical and end-to-end -end learning based methods. Um, all the methods are described today and belong to this class of modular learning based methods, which are actually very similar. They all have three modules. The first one for perception, mapping, and localization. 
the second one for long-term waypoint selection, and the third one for low-level control. We saw how modularization and explicit maps help in uh, addressing the drawbacks of both classical and end-to-end -end learning methods and lead to effective long-term memory and planning for both spatial and semantic understanding tasks uh, and with, with a much lower sample complexity. So over the past few years, we have trained uh, navigation models and game-like environments to more realistic simulation environments based on re reconstruction. But obviously our goal is to um, have these agents working in the real world. And it turns out that um, these modular learning models uh, work well in the real world also. So here we transfer the active neural SLAM model trained in simulation uh, on a hardware locobot platform. And we uh, train the we, we deploy the model trained in simulation directly to the real world without any fine tuning. So the video here uh, shows a demo of our agent predicting the map and goes accurately in the real world and exploring uh, a large uh, real world apartment scene effectively. Similarly, we can also transfer the semantic exploration model uh, to do object goal navigation in the real world. So the video here is showing a successful example of a robot navigating to a potted plant. And here's another example with a third person view. And the reason uh, uh, the modular learning models are able to transfer well to the real world is, is that the modularization allows our modules to be domain invariant. So remember that the global policy is working uh, on the top-down map space and the top-down map space itself is domain invariant. It looks very similar in simulation in the real world. And to bridge the physical uh, simulation to real domain gap, we have also used uh, um, noise models based on real world data. So uh, we have barely um, scratched the surface of active visual learning. Um, the, uh, this, when we are having agents uh, navigate intelligently in environments, it opens up a lot of possibilities to actually improve the perception by moving in the environment. Uh, there are many exciting opportunities to uh, first, learn policies to do this kind of exploration. And second, to uh, use this exploration for few short learning. So suppose uh, we are given a single or a few labels uh, for a new object. Uh, we can actually learn policies to look at the subject from different viewpoints and uh, learn object detection and segmentation with much fewer data. And obviously, we don't want our agents to just move in the environment. Once we have intelligent navigation agents, we also want them to interact uh, with objects and do even more intelligent tasks. So if you're interested in um, exploring these future research directions, you can check out the open source code for several projects I presented today. And we'll be releasing more code very soon. Uh, and you can also read about our research in some media articles. And finally, I would like to thank uh, my amazing collaborators uh, without whom none of this research I presented today would be possible. Uh, I want to especially thank uh, my advisor, Russ, who has been guiding me since the beginning of my PhD. Uh, I have learned a lot of things uh, from Russ, like technical knowledge, presentation and whatnot. But uh, the special thing about Russ is that every time I meet with him, he seems more excited about my research than uh, me. And this is, uh, just invaluable, it has kept me motivated throughout the PhD. And I also want to thank Abhinav, who has helped me a lot in the later half of my PhD. And among many things I've learned from him, he's constantly reminded me to think of the big picture, to think about things what really matter. And he has been the most influential in uh, convincing me to work uh, with real robots in the real world. And without him, uh, we would not be able to Realize, realize the full potential of our research. Uh, and thank you all for joining. Uh, links to all the papers, demo videos, code, pretend models uh, are available on my webpage. And at this time, I'm happy to take questions. All right, that's great. Um, thanks, Devendra. Um, we're right on time. So we're gonna start um, uh, with committee members asking questions. So maybe we can start with Jitendra going first as, uh, as the most remote person from, uh, uh, from CMU. 
Okay. Uh, yes, and, and nice work, Devendra. So uh, I'm going to ask a more philosophical question because your work was about modularization, which mm -hmm. is slightly at odds with the standard end-to-end -end view. Uh, but in the classical literature in control, they had a way of formalizing this idea of modularizing. So they call this the separation principle. And they, they like in this whole world of Kalman filtering and so forth, where you have linear models and Gaussian noise and so on, there are actually theorems which say that we can do this and we undergo no loss in performance. Now, mm -hmm. of course, your world is very much more complicated because since we're using neural networks, it, we are not obviously gone, we have gone beyond those linear models. But it seems to be a more, it, it, it seems to be a more pragmatic and experimental finding that, that this uh, modular systems work well. Uh, do you, have you, do you have any speculation to offer on what should, could be possible to say theoretically, or at least have a good guidance to people designing systems as to when this separation principle is good to follow? Yeah, uh, so um, I think the modularization becomes uh, really important um, when um, the, the, the task is long term and exploration or like learning just uh, from end to end, uh, like reinforcement learning is, is just way too expensive. So um, it's basically just saying that you want to um, learn in a space where uh, you can learn a, a policy in, in kind of tractable compute uh, computation time, right? In the sense that if, if your uh, trajectories are super long, if you learn in, in like a very low level space, um, then basically the uh, models are not just not going to work uh, with, the, with the current compute uh, we have. And so we want to like abstract things out where like we can learn in a, a more like a higher level space and uh, and basically the, poly, the all the learning is kind of like tractable in that sense. So, I mean, in these environments, if you have like hundreds of steps to reach the goal, if you are just using, you know, RL, the exploration comp complexity is exponential in the time horizon. And uh, we can just abstract out the lower level control with the high level decision making of, or reasoning of where to explore and then learn kind of much more efficiently. Okay, well, let me put it in the other way. Let's say, mm -hmm. Are there any counter examples? So, so it's a very plausible thing to say. I mean, it's a good engineering design principle, right? In computer science, software engineering, mm -hmm. modularity is considered a good thing. So, can you can you uh, can you give me a? Is there a counter example? Is there a setting where where you would say no? We should not have modularity. Yeah, so I mean, uh, your, your arguments were sort of sample complexity arguments. So, mm -hmm. and that's fine, and that's a good thing in practice. Yeah. But where, is that the only one? And there might, would there, could there be situations where, given enough samples, then you would get a superior performance from a system which was not modular? Yeah, that, that's totally possible. So, the basically the weakness of modularity is um, the errors propagate across different modules. So basically, if, if you know my initial module is making errors because my subsequent modules are kind of independent, they cannot uh, you know, uh, improve on those errors. And these errors will kind of accumulate over different subsequent modules and like uh, uh, they will, they'll be kind of propagated. So that, that's the weakness of modularity. If you have an end-to-end -end system, um, you know, some errors or noise and uh, the first uh, parts can be like kind of improved on in the later parts. Um, so yeah, if, if there is a lot of data, there is of course a potential that end-to-end -end learning can work better. Okay, I, I'll ask one more question which on the mm -hmm. same sort of theme, which is, mm -hmm. again, I'm, I'm trying to basically connect what you are doing to more traditional ideas. 
So there's a more traditional idea which would go back to like say the Bayesian world, okay? Mm -hmm. Which would say that the way you combine modules is that you never give a point estimate, you have probability distributions. And then you and then you are then you're fine. Then you can uh, you can transfer those probability distributions in, in in your in your analysis. So no module gets like a single estimate. The module mm -hmm. gets a probability distribution. Mm -hmm. Now uh, that now of course the traditional response to so there's a traditional approach and then there's a traditional response to that traditional approach, which is okay, the complexity is going to blow up. Mm -hmm. I mean, in certain settings, we can do particle filters and so on, but often mm -hmm. the complexity will blow up. Mm -hmm. Now, in the world of uh, deep learning and neural networks, uh, do you feel that we have solved this problem or we have punted the problem or it's no longer so important? I mean, what are your thoughts on this? Oh, this problem is still very existing. So even in the semantic maps we are building, we are we are uh, working with a particular resolution. And you know, uh, if you increase the size of the map or like, you know, increase the resolution of the map, then you know things blow up, and we are like uh, not not able to train these models on like current GPU memory sizes. Uh, and and so tractability in the sense of uh, how accurate these predictions are, or, or in terms of uh, encoding uncertainty in these predictions. It's definitely the case that we, we haven't solved that problem. But uh, I, I want to point out that um, like there's another kind of um, difference in, in modularity and end-to-end -end learning is, is that and when we are designing all these modules, we have kind of put in some indu inductive bias on what we think are good representations, what a map should be like. We, we designed a spatial representation and, and the, uh, we designed the map to be structured. Um, so even if you encode you know, these uh, uncertainties in the estimates, um, there is still this argument um, which is in favor of end-to-end -end learning is that um, the inductive biases you've put in, in the model are not the best biases. The end-to-end -end learning model can learn potentially better representations than what we have designed. Uh, so um, the, there is still that kind of benefit. If you have like a lot of data, like and you know, unlimited compute, then end-to-end um, -end learning can still work better. Uh, e even if you encode like uncertainty in your predictions in audio systems. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jitendra. Um, Devi, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, yeah, it was a, a really nice talk. Uh, I really appreciated some of the the big overview slides that you sort of summarized the common themes in your work and even related it to um, other sort of classic approaches to this problem and as well as comparing to other learning-based <laughs> approaches. Um, so on this first, I think it's a philosophical question. You have to bear with me as I try to kind of piece it eloquently in my head. Um, and it's it's trying to compare to these classic approaches. So you have this nice way of um, uh, sort of different dimensions in which uh, learning based and modular systems differ or similar from from classic pipelines for um, navigation. Um, but I feel like one thing that you didn't highlight is um, essentially um, different assumptions about priors. Um, and what I mean by that is, Classic approaches, uh, you can think of a map as a as a prior of what you expect to see in the world, and in in that setting, if you have a map in your hand, uh, like in some ways, it feels like the the definition of what it means to generalize is really different because maps are almost by construction the opposite of generalization. It's memorization. I've mm -hmm. been here before. I've seen it, so I know what to expect. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and it seems like that's a like a fundamental tenet of of how. Like a like a classic robotics pipeline would work, you know, mapping localization and then hook that up to a, a perception system. Or I'm sorry, like a, a final navigation system. Um, and so I know that you know one way to kind of <clears throat> kind of circumvent that question is say, no, 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 I'm not. I'm defining the problem to be an exploration problem. You know, I'm being put mm -hmm. in a place that I've never seen before. But then you still have other assumptions about what you've trained on. 
um, like I assume in all these setups, you, okay, I haven't been in this house before, but I've been in similar houses. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I just want to push back of like, why is that the right setting? As in, um, um, like I would imagine most of the time Roombas, 99% of the time that they operate, it's actually in the same house. It's not in a, mm -hmm. in a, in a brand new house. And so um, I, I guess it's just sort of more of a thought experiment of like, even in learning-based approaches, there are assumptions about priors, but it feels like mm -hmm. you're drawing a line in the sand about, okay, these priors are okay, and these priors are not. Mm -hmm. I just want to sort of think through uh, like the pros and cons of that, of, of splitting it up in that way. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So, um, um, so, so first thing about like the, the map and, and memorization. So uh, yeah, you're right that, you know, map is kind of like, uh, you know, memorizing the environment, right? Um, but but the key um, thing is that um, we we want uh, these agents to have an episodic memory, so we want some sort of uh, memorization in the sense that it should remember what parts of the environment it are already explored, so that you know you're not wasting time exploring the same thing again, uh, and you're like exploring new things. So we we want episodic memory. We don't want this memory to kind of like. Um, you know, be, be across environments in the sense that, you know, we do, just don't memorize the map uh, and like try to use it for another environment. So like we, we still want generalization in that sense, but we want within the same episode to uh, have like a good episodic memory. So you're not wasting time. Um, and uh, it turns out like actually the end-to-end -end learning methods, they uh, struggle a lot with generalization because they actually memorize the location of objects. So their training set performance is actually very high because they know like exactly where the chair is, where the sofa is in the, in the uh, environment. And like, you know, where each observation, what action has, needs to be taken to reach that kind of uh, object. But when, when we are doing this kind of modelization, we are only learning on top-down maps, like the long-term policy is only based on top-down maps. Then this uh, memorization becomes difficult. Memorization across, you know, different episodes. Uh, because you know, each time we are starting at a random location, each time we are going to look at a different, you know, subset of the environment, and uh, that kind of helps in generalization. Um, and and to your second part, right? Uh, in many uh, practical settings, uh, we would have like a robot operating in environments which are like already explored, right? Um, so I did not present the results uh, today, but like we do have experiments on sequential goals, where basically uh, we are saying that after reaching the first goal, now you're given a second goal, how fast can you reach it? Um, so we basically saw that as we increase the number of sequential goals, the importance of our global or long-term policy reduces, but the importance of mapping kind of increases. So map kind of helps you remember, uh, you know, already uh, explored objects and you can like go there more efficiently, but like, the long-term policy is not very useful because you have kind of like already explored a large part of the environment. And then we saw this across both uh, kind of object goal and image goal experiments. Uh, so again, like the, the map as a form of episodic memory is very useful even in those cases. Got it, that was, that was great. So actually you, you kind of answered this follow-up that I was gonna ask, which is okay. Like another way to flip the question on its head is so pretend that you you know you're you're deploying this thing this robot in a setting where you you've been here before, and so can you still you know use your techniques and use your yeah. modular framework to uh, you know do navigation to point goals or even to target objects? And I guess you nicely answered that by saying yes, you've explored sequential um, yeah. for the of the problem where you've um, so that's yeah, that's yeah that's that's super cool to see. And also that feels somehow to me that somehow feels more, more I don't know like practical I guess. Yeah. Um, um, so let me then, I just, uh, okay, let me sort of flip to another, another question that sort of popped up. Um, so the, the last stuff with the, the semantic curiosity was, was fun to see. I hadn't seen that before. Um, and so it reminded me a lot of, I guess, you know, you had this nice point about, um, you think there's a lot of forward looking um, work to be done in this world of like active, active learning in, in, a, in an environment where you get to choose what you observe next. Um, and in the vision side, I guess, you know, there's this sort of old school way of formulating this sometimes called active vision, um, mm -hmm. sort of, uh, which has the same flavor as well, where you're trying to move around in such a way to 
learn more about your environment. And but but from one perspective, I almost feel like if you took an active vision philosophy to the problems you were showing in the last uh, sort of the, the the last piece of work. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, we from wrong, but it almost feels like what you're at what you're advocating is almost the opposite of that. Um, so active vision might say, let me move around in such a way that I can become more certain about what the label of this object is. Mm -hmm. And I think that the semantic curiosity philosophy is let me move around so that it flickers more. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I, I'm just curious about, uh, I don't know, what is the right way to uh, reconcile those two views yeah. of how active Asians should, move, should, should behave? Yeah, uh, so I, I think like uh, there are like two different uh, kind of setup. So in our setup, what we assumed is like we have a training phase where like our agent is, you know, uh, moving around the environment and trying to find as many uncertain things as possible so that like we can learn from that um, and like, you know, uh, do better at test uh, trajectories. What you are saying is kind of at the test time, we want to optimize for reducing uncertainty. So at the training time, we want to kind of maximize uncertainty so that we get better data to train from. But at the test time, yeah, you're right. Like you, we want to move around the object, you know, to look at it from different viewpoints to minimize our uncertainty, right? Um, so yeah, it depends on the kind of setting uh, you want like active perception to work in, right? I see. I, I guess maybe maybe it sort of falls under this kind of like explore, exploit trade-off. Exactly, where... yeah, exactly. So at training time, we are like exploring and test time, we probably want to exploit to reduce the uncertainty, yeah. Uh, very cool. Um, and just one more, one more thing that kind of pops up too, is it feels like a lot of the, when you start thinking of semantics, it feels very natural to, because you're in this um, rigid 3D environment, you should really think, uh, I would think that one natural way to think about it is that you want to not label pixels or label images, you want to label things in the, in the 3D world. Mm -hmm. um, because there's a, in some sense, a physical map, um, mm -hmm. you know, the chairs over here. Um, and so I would have thought that one of the big wins you have with that is, um, you know, even if you can't, like, even if you can't see something, I know that it's there because I've mm -hmm. sort of placed it in my map. Or mm -hmm. even if I see only a little bit of it. Um, yeah. But I feel like you were showing examples of, like, um, I forgot the slide, but, you know, there's an example of a staircase where we only saw a little piece of it and then mistakenly thought it was a chair. Mm -hmm. But I would have thought that's exactly where this kind of, you know, semantic recognition in a 3D coordinate frame would save the day by kind of, like, yes. integrating evidence over time. Um, I know that's not a chair um, because I've sort of seen it from other views before. Um, yeah, uh, that's that's actually a great point. Uh, so uh, basically uh, in all these settings, there is a trade-off between false positives and false negatives. So like, as you said, we can, you know, increase our prediction uh, threshold by just saying that if I detect, you know, these set of uh, voxels as chair from like, let's say five different viewpoints, only then I'm gonna call it a chair versus like just detecting it once, right? So you can increase the threshold for uh, detecting an object. But then this also increases the false negative cases where like you are only detecting the object from one or two viewpoints and you're not detecting it from other viewpoints and then you will miss out on that object. So there is basically a trade-off. So we try to like kind of play around with this threshold and uh, try to optimize, but like as we, you know, it's, it's basically like if we, decrease the false positives and false negatives increase and so on. So, um, so is, is, is what we're saying that this is stemming from the fact that it's more of an online task that if yes. you were, because the first time you see it, you have to say something about it, but if you're willing to wait and integrate and see it for more views, then, then you could have resolved this false positive. Uh, not necessarily because again, like we are using the, this mask and our CNN trained on static data set. So, you know, uh, like it, about, about, like if you look at, the same, you know, object from 10 different viewpoints. Maybe like, you know, five times it says it's a particular object and five other times it doesn't detect it, right? And now it's basically the question of where you want to set the threshold uh, of the object detection. Because if you set it too high, then you'll have false negatives. If you set it too low, you'll have false positives. And I mean, it, it doesn't seem to be like a right threshold. Like every time sure. you increase or decrease, there are like cases on sure. the other side. So yeah. Okay, okay, that answers my questions. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks, Deva. Uh, Abhinav, uh, do you have questions? Yeah, I'm here. Um, I have been going in and out uh, because of the work going on in my house. So 
I might ask a question which is someone asked already. So you can just say, oh, someone asked it and it's okay uh, later on. But I mean, for me, I, I'll just ask one simple question looking to the future uh, mostly, uh, which is basically now that you have done so much, I mean, what's the biggest bottleneck? Why do I still not see semantic robots? I, I'm like these robots, semantically navigating robots in my home yet. Why, what's remaining here? I mean, and what would you work on next? Uh, if you have to pick a prediction today uh, and I just want to basically that kind of tells me what is missing also like if you tell me what you're going to work on next yeah uh, mm -hmm. yeah so uh, I think um, like in terms of navigation there are like two uh, big failure modes um, I kind of uh, pointed it out here so there is inefficient exploration and ineffective perception. So for inefficient exploration, I think uh, what we need is just more data because uh, for exploration, each you know scene is kind of like one data point um, or, or like a few data points. And we are working with like hundred scenes um, and it's just like not sufficient to learn exploration maybe. And if you just scale it up to have like more scenes, we can do much better at exploration. And also like, I mean, in, in this 20%, there will be cases where even humans fail, like just find it steps are not uh, sufficient for exploration. So that's, that's one. And then the other thing is an effective perception. And um, I think like active visual learning is like a big, um, very exciting kind of field to work on to improve this perception. And it, it's gonna be actually very, uh, I, I believe it's gonna be very useful in uh, the real world also. So here I, um, I showed some examples. Uh, basically, like you, you can use this framework to do, um, you know, uh, self-supervised improvement of your policy or and, and like perception model uh, by just like kind of moving around, like as they were mentioned, moving around the object, you know, uh, looking at it from different viewpoints, you can uh, have a much better perception uh, system. And also it can help in um, kind of learning like how humans learn. So we, it's a, you know, no one gives us the exact bounding box or like exact you know segmentation for every frame, right? Um, people just, I mean, tell you, okay, this is a chair and you know this is how it looks like, and then you actually move around and, and see it from different viewpoints. So that's what I'm showing on the right here. Like uh, we have been working on this, trying to see that uh, if we have like one or few labels of a particular object, can we build a 3D representation, do viewpoint transformation, and project these labels back to a different viewpoint. And this will basically allow us to get a lot more data from a single label. Um, and, and this can help in improving perception in general, but uh, more specifically embodied perception because you know these viewpoints uh, are, are based on how embodied agents are gonna perceive the environment. So I think like, yeah, this um, like to improve navigation, but like you have to improve the perception and, and the exploration. And, and I mean, once so we have, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, but, but I, I I understand you are going it, but I think going back to Jitendra's question, so I was there for that one, um, mm. that modularity thing, right? I mean, now if you're actually going in this direction, active visual learning, you're putting the modules back together and you want to train them together again. Is that what you're thinking? Or I think the whole selling point of the modularity was that you could use models of the internet and just magical things. So, okay, the problem is, and it's going to remain in the longer term is, there's no way you'll get thousands of scenes or hundreds of thousands of scenes, at least not in simulation or anything. I mean, it's so hard to model at that level, right? I mean, so either we have to make our machine learning different, which is does not work on diverse scene, but just somehow learns to generalize from five to 10 scenes, which is what humans do, right? I mean, as babies, we are not seeing hundreds and thousands of uh, different houses or something like that, but somehow we still learn to generalize. So either mm -hmm. we have to change our machine learning paradigm, which is, I think this was a question we were discussing. I, I remember during your proposal, like how yeah. do you, how does this work versus, yeah. I mean, my, my feeling was that the reason you are saying is that that's not going to happen. That's why end learning is not going to work. And so I'm proposing modular and modular is what is model is going to provide me this amazing opportunity to just take images from the internet and make it work uh, somehow, which is easy to get diverse and, mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, so that's what my at least feeling was that this modularity brings this amazing piece into this whole picture that I, this physicality and simulations are restricted by the diversity, but mm -hmm. modularity can steal diversity from other locations uh, 
for example, internet images to actually bring diversity and which is more suitable to our machine learning. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, I mean, I philosophically I understand the idea of going to active visual learning. I mean, I, mm -hmm. in fact, I, I mean, you and I did this paper in, as well as so on. But mm -hmm. I mean, engineering wise, it seems like active visual learning is now not like it's opposite to what you were saying in modularity. Maybe I understand it wrong. It, in term, but I want to know what you think on that one. What, yeah. what I just asked you. Yeah. So, um, uh, so I mean, you, you're right. Like, there's one benefit of modularity that we can use, like the model strain on internet data um, and as a module, and like you know, do better. Uh, so, when I'm saying active visual learning, like I'm not just saying that we start from scratch. We still use the, those models, you know, trained on internet data. It's just that we can improve them with like active data. And uh, because most of this is unsupervised, this is not like relying on simulation, we could potentially do this in, in the real world. Uh, so basically, like we, we can have specialized models for uh, the environment you are operating in. And uh, the basically the robot just kind of explores the environment, keeps learning in that same environment and kind of specializes to that environment. And that is kind of possible with uh, this actor usual learning framework, right? Um, and then the other thing about you know uh, generalization and then like kind of uh, learning from few scenes, right? Um, so you're right. Like I mean, you know, babies do learn from like tens of scenes or something like that. Um, and I mean, I think um, like so. In general, machine learning methods, the current machine learning methods require much more data than humans do. But um, if you want to like kind of reduce the you know, requirement of data with the current set of methods. Uh, what, I mean, we can just, um, uh, you know, reduce our expectations in terms of the most efficient exploration. Like, it's okay if, you know, I cannot find the object in 500 steps. It's, I mean, I'll take 1,000 steps. Uh, but what, eventually what you want is like our systems to work well in uh, the environments they are operating in, like even if they're a little inefficient. So um, I, the current, framework of modularity allows for that because you know we have this uh, map which is building over time so even if we don't pick you know the most efficient long term goals to like quickly explore the map even if they are kind of suboptimal because we have this map we know what areas are explored what is unexplored we can still over a longer episode still explore the whole map um, and then like we can use this active visual learning to improve our perception in that kind of environment. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, okay, that's fine. Um, yeah, I'm done this one. Thanks, uh, thanks, Abhinav. Um, Devinder, I have just a couple of quick, quick questions. Um, so um, first of all, can you, you know, there was a question of like modularity versus um, versus end to end. Can you mention which part of your models you can train offline? So in other words, imagine mm -hmm. like, you know, you agency, you know, maybe thousands of robots moving around in thousands of houses, collecting the data using some policy. What is it that you can train versus, you know, end-to-end -end reinforcement learning? Mm -hmm. Because just, just to the point that I remember you did mention to me that at CVPR 2019, mm -hmm. you know, you won the competition. But mm -hmm. then uh, someone, one of the organizers said, well, we've simulated uh, millions of uh, hours of our millions. agents navigating the room yeah. and we solved the problem, mm -hmm. um, right? So uh, there is kind of, I mean, maybe it was an easy problem, but mm -hmm. uh, obviously we can't have uh, millions of uh, robots navigating in the houses and kind of learning online jointly, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe you, maybe you can say like which, which parts are, you know, can be trained off, offline and which parts really need to be trained online. They actually need to have a physical robot moving around and learning about the environment. Yeah, um, uh, that's a great question. So, um, like among all these modules, um, so the the first module, the perception mapping localization, um, this can potentially be trained offline uh, because this is a supervised learning model in most cases. Um, so we basically we just like take the sequence of RGB observations and we get want to get the map and pose right. And um, in most of our cases, we uh, train in an, in an offline manner. And the second uh, part, it depends on the task, I would say. So like exploration, so for the tasks where we can get the optimal trajectory uh, in, in like an you know, 
tractable amount of time, we can use offline learning. So for example, in the image goal navigation task, we actually train this model, this global policy offline, which just by sampling like pairs of images and like estimating the distance between them in an offline manner, right? Um, but in, in the case of exploration, we don't know what is the right policy because it's like an NP hard problem to efficiently explore an unseen environment, right? Um, and for that case, we probably need some, you know, active data uh, and use like reinforcement learning. Um, and in, in the third case, local policy in most of our cases, because we don't have dynamic object, uh, dynamic obstacles, the deterministic policy worked well, so we didn't even require much training. Uh, but I would imagine this is uh, like in more realistic scenarios, maybe there are dynamic obstacles, there are, um, you know, deformable obstacles or, um, you know, things like water where you cannot just go over that. Um, you would need some sort of active policy. And this, I think, needs to be trained in the real world because this will rely on, you know, visual observations a lot more than the global policy. So uh, it, at least I think it would be need to be fine-tuned in the real world. Uh, to get like effective local policy. But that would, uh, presumably the argument here is that with your modular approach, it will require fewer samples or less time to actually adapt in, you know, adapt yes. the entire system in the real world, right? Compared yes, to exactly. kind of doing end-to-end -end, uh, uh, yeah. in a fashion, right? Yeah, so okay. I mean, uh, in our experiments, we did see that, you know, our performance at just 500,000 frames was like way better than reinforcement learning with 75 million frames. Um, so, and that is because of modularity. We are like breaking down the problem space and um, that reduces the sample complexity gap. Right, and one last question. Maybe you, uh, maybe you can mention a little bit more about your active learning kind of like experience because to me, that seems like super interesting. I wanna have, you know, I'm very fascinating by, fascinated by the few shot kind of learning problem, right? Mm -hmm. Where, I throw you in the environment, I show you Chewbacca, and I say, this is called Chewbacca, and mm -hmm. you figure out what that means, uh, right? And mm -hmm. so you kind of want to be able to learn actively, move around the object, figure out what it is, learn as much as possible with pretty much just a single labeled example in a self-supervised way. Yeah. Um, right. To me, it seems like this is sort of uh, uh, a holy grail of, you know, you know, every time I talk to Josh Tenenbaum, I was doing postdoc with him, he would always say, Look, people can do it in, in, in existing kind of vision systems. You have to show, you know, Chewbacca under different lighting conditions. You have to Chewbacca in different viewpoints. You have to, do a, yeah. you have to generate thousands of examples before the system can say, okay, I understand what this is. And it seems yeah. to see a lot of existing self-supervised learning uh, approaches, they just do data augmentation, right? And sort of mm -hmm. maybe you can mention a little bit more about how is it that you're attacking that specific problem, combining mm -hmm. active vision with, uh, with the... Uh, with this modular kind of uh, setting that you're building. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so this is super exciting to me too. Uh, I think, yeah, like if these things work as well as we, um, you know, hope them they will, then I mean, we can basically change, you know, we can, we can overcome the shortcoming of modern, you know, machine learning and computer vision models where we require like, you know, hundreds of thousands of uh, densely annotated examples to train our models. Uh, because like this again, as you said, like we can just have one or few labels and we can look at it from different viewpoints. And again, uh, because we are learning in the active setting and we, you know, we have like the spatial map, we can look at it at different uh, points in the day under different lighting conditions, um, you know, different shadows and so on. So like we can get a lot of data from just a single maybe, label. Uh, maybe, maybe just one question, what, what's holding us back? Um, I think the, the, the yeah. question a little bit. What, what, yeah, why, yeah. So I think, uh, yeah. So one one uh, big challenge in uh, all these, you know, uh, models where which are building like three D semantic maps is just uh, memory efficiency. So because like I mean, when most of the navigation models we build like top down two D maps. And that worked out to be fine, but like once we start doing like you know active vision, we need to build like three D maps, and the memory just blows up like because now you're like uh, the map is becomes like fifty times, and now if you want to do it in like very large environments, so uh, it, the map doesn't fit on our GPU memories. Uh, so the, there has to be some kind of 
advances in uh, how to efficiently represent the spatial map, uh, maybe we can do something like um, we have a high resolution map, you know, around the agent, but uh, we have like a low resolution uh, in other places. And then as the agent moves, we change the resolution of the map. Um, so somehow, somehow like kind of compressing the map when it's not used and like decompressing it back uh, accurately uh, when we need to. So that's one of the main challenges, I think, um, you know, like kind of doing it efficiently. Okay, excellent. Uh, maybe yeah. we can circle back uh, to the committee members uh, for, for, for a second round, if, 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 if there are any questions. Uh, Jitana, do you have any, any, any follow-up questions or? Uh, no, no further questions. Right. Uh, Deva, do you have any questions? Uh, no, I'm fine, thanks. Uh, Abhinav? No, I'm fine. Too. Okay, maybe just, uh, are there sort of questions from the audience? We typically ask. Uh, speak up if you if you have a question. I guess I have a question. Um, can can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. So I guess uh, for so I really love this modular design of the of the of the architectures and all of that. But I, I guess I'm kind of wondering that. I mean, this modular design has been known in robotics forever, right? That there should be a mapping component, there should be a planning component, and, and right? I'm mm -hmm. wondering, have you thought about how some of these ideas could be extended to manipulation? Mm -hmm. and because I think, I mean, in some sense, like classical robotic solutions for navigation work. Now you can say that you are improving them, you are adding semantic reasoning and all of that, and I agree with that, uh, all, of, mm -hmm. all of the motivation over there. But I'm wondering, like, uh, solutions to manipulation don't work as well. And I'm curious if you have thought how some of the things that you have proposed would be useful for doing better manipulation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah. so this is something uh, we have been thinking about also. So um, I, I think like similar modularization can be used for manipulation also. So you have like, um, you know, a, a perception module responsible for mapping and pose estimation um, now, I mean, for navigation, 2D top-down maps are okay, but for manipulation, you will obviously need 3D maps. And then, you know, instead of like a global policy for long-term goal, we can we could have like a, 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 a long-term policy, but this time maybe like suggesting, you know, grasps or like uh, actuator locations to move to uh, in order to, you know, interact with the object. And then the local policy is basically the low-level control to actually move to that location. Um, so, I mean, uh, there is some work in manipulation, which actually does this kind of modularization um, and, you know, in robotics. And I think those are like kind of the state of the art methods right now, um, like which, you know, generate graphs separately and uh, do like uh, classical analytical planning to do those graphs uh, as opposed to like end-to-end -end learning um, for, for like manipulation tasks. And um, uh, I think the, the key challenge again there also is memory efficiency. So if you, we want to do like manipulation and like, you know, with, with very small objects, we will need to build very fine grained 3D maps. And uh, like uh, the, the challenge is memory efficiency. Like if you have a very fine grained res resolution of the 3D map, then, um, you know, things start blowing up. Um, and also like planning becomes more expensive. Thank you. Thanks. That's it. Any, any other questions? All right. So I guess um, we're going to have, uh, the committee is going to stay. We're going to have to kick out uh, uh, everybody except for the yeah. committee members. So, so Devendra, maybe what we can do is I can Slack you and you can just yeah. join. That. Let me that make you the or? host before that uh, so that. Uh, you know, the meeting doesn't end. Uh, I guess we don't want to end the meeting. Yeah, so I've made you the host now. Um, okay.